and Eli. In those days, the word of the Lord was rare. There were not many visions. One night, Eli, whose eyes were becoming so weak that he could barely see, was lying down in his usual place. The lamp of God had not yet gone out and Samuel was lying down in the house of the Lord where the ark of God was. Then the Lord called Samuel. Samuel answered, Here I am. And he ran to Eli and said, Here I am, you called me. But Eli said, I did not call. Go back and lie down. So he went and lay down. Again the Lord called Samuel, and Samuel got up and went to Eli and said, Here I am, you did call me. My son Eli said, I did not call. Go back and lie down. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord. The word of the Lord had not yet been revealed to him. A third time the Lord called, Samuel! And Samuel got up and went to Eli and said, Here I am, you called me. And Eli realised that the Lord was calling the boy. So he told Samuel, Go and lie down. And if he calls you, say, Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. The Lord came and stood there, calling us at other times, Samuel, Samuel. Then Samuel said, Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. Samuel heard the, verse, verse, the voice of God for the first time in his life. He was in the right place at the right time. He'd been dedicated to God from his youth in response to Hannah's prayer. And so he was near to the covenant box. He was willing to be there, willing to listen. Where do you go to listen to God? How do you find yourself listening to God? The uh, fourth series of the Advent um, sheet that um, Ben prepared for us was all about listening, how we listen to God. And as we went around as a group and shared the ways we listened to God, it was very revealing. Um, it's a good thing to think about. How do we listen to God? Samuel was close to the covenant box and he followed his teacher's instructions. Eli said, just say, speak, Lord, and your servant hears. And, and, he, and God spoke. One of the times when I feel... Uh, quite close to God, is when I do a take-time meditation. This take-time meditation that Clive has um, launched, really, uh, in this area, um, and he's now taking it nationally. It's going to be in the Oxford Diocese and into all the schools in Oxford. Um, very encouraging to hear what he was saying. It's, that it's just a simple exercise of finding yourself comfortable and listening to someone reading to you a story, a, Jesus, a story about Jesus. And at the end of the story, um, the speaker says, well now, um, Jesus is saying to you, come near by name. He calls you by name and speaks to you. He says, takes you to one side, having heard the story. And, so, and the speaker says, well now I encourage you to speak your heart to Jesus. And I just found it a very moving time to be. Very often, only a five-minute meditation that I'm doing. But what comes into my mind to share <laughs> always surprises me. Or it doesn't always surprise me. It often surprises me. And what Jesus says in the context um, sometimes surprises me. And uh, he might tell him I'm wrong or I'm right. But what I feel as I do a take-time meditation it's the affirmation of his love for me, that he wants to speak to me. And he affirms who I am. 
So, as I said, take time is freely available on Zoom, taketime.org, and you can log into it. Um, it's completely free. You can do it any time you like. Like You do need a mobile phone or an internet connection. Um, there are take time together meditation times, and Clive runs those on the second and uh, fourth Tuesday at 7.30 till 8 um, every month. And if you'd like the link to that, um, Pat or I will give it to you. We also have, on the 7th of every month, as a church, we have a take time session. At the moment it's on Zoom, but it could be in person again. But I would commend the idea of sitting down, listening to a Bible story or reading a Bible story, and then asking Jesus what he wants to say to you. Because it does feel amazingly powerful. We live past Jesus' life and death and resurrection, so we know that God the Holy Spirit lives within each one of us, but we need to reaffirm and re-invite him to refill us, to fill us up, because we leak and because we want to grow more like Jesus and more able to share his good news. All things are permitted for me, but not all things are beneficial. All things are permitted for me, but I will not be dominated by anything. Food is meant for the stomach, and the stomach for food, and God will destroy both one and the other. The body is meant not for sexual immorality, but for the Lord, and the Lord for the body. And God raised the Lord, and will also raise us by his power. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Should I therefore take the members of Christ and make them members of a prostitute? Never. Do you not know that whoever is united to a prostitute becomes one body with her? For it is said, the two shall be one flesh. But if anyone united to the Lord becomes one spirit with him, shuns sexual immorality, every sin that a person commits is outside the body, but the sexual immoral person sins against the body itself. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, which you have from God, and that you are not your own? for you were bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body. Another thing that struck me when we were doing the covenant service, um, we said we become part of the Holy Catholic Church with a small c. And uh, Jesus, when he prayed for his disciples, prayed for them that they may be one as I am with the Father and you are in me. Um, now you know on my heart, churches together in East Quincy has, has become a, a great um, interest to mine, if nothing else. I've shared with you before, I think, post-Covid, it felt that really um, we could find ways of doing more than just a Good Friday service. Uh, and the good news was that uh, last Wednesday, although this week that's coming is the, the week of prayer for Christian unity. Um, we had a celebration of that last Wednesday when six churches got together at JCC and we had a, a good session of prayer and praise together with different churches bringing their influence to it. Um, it reminded me and encouraged me of how when we did take time last year, um, every church in the town um, focused on one evening and had a prayer mission at their, at their church uh, for thy kingdom come. My prayer would be that that would be even bigger this year than it was then. And in, in regard to that, um, this um, Thursday, there's a meeting of the leaders of all the churches in East Grinstead because Ben has assumed um, chairmanship of the churches together in East Grinstead and so we're hosting it here and all the churches, he wants all the members, all the leaders of churches come together to see how that might move forward. And so whether you find any more time in the week to pray for uh, church unity, 
um, could I commend to you to pray for Thursday lunchtime uh, when the church leaders will meet with Ben um, to share their vision of where that might go. God wants to bring his people together. There are always things that divide, but God wants us to focus on the things that unite. And we've sung about them, we've shared them today. We're united in a God who loves us and knows everything about us. We're united in following Jesus who laid down his life. We might be forgiven. And we rejoice in the Holy Spirit who fills us and comes and lives within us. One of the challenges that um, home groups were looking at last week with this listening course was how can we more regularly uh, come together? How can we get together more frequently um, to hear God speak to us in a united way? We need to do it every church, but we need to do it throughout the churches as well. But it was a challenge was to saying that uh, there needs to be vibrant. I was coming across something that said um, for prayers to be answered, you need vibrant worship, dedicated um, followers, um, and prayer and fasting. And so I saw that as a seed, really, whether that's something we need to look at as a church of how we're going to listen to God more carefully and uh, hear what he's got to say for us. The, uh, our text, though, is your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit and you're bought with a price. Temples are usually filled with treasure, but I, like you, perhaps, am guilty of failing to recognise the tremendous treasure that uh, the Holy Spirit is living within me. He is treasure because the power that raised Jesus from the dead is that same power that lives within us. He raises us to everlasting life, but he lives now to help us to be revolutionary. Jesus didn't call us to sit down comfortably and say, thank you very much, I'm pleased I've got there, I've arrived, I'm in your kingdom, um, I'll wait till I get there. He calls us to make his salvation known to those who don't yet know him. He calls us to reach out to the sad and the lonely, the prisoners, the deceived, and tell them of his death and resurrection. That is the means by which they can know their path to everlasting life and peace in their life now. When I wrote down in my text about reaching out to prisoners, I am reminded that um, on this Wednesday evening at 7.30, uh, Prison Fellowship um, are holding a, a video for people to learn more about Prison Fellowship. It's been in the notice sheet last week, it'll be in, it's in this week as well. Um, there is a sense in which Prison Fellowship needs uh, more prayers, more people to pray, because as I go into prisons um, to run the Sycamore Tree course, as you know, I, I wasn't involved with it at all until lockdown, when someone said to me, they need a tutor for the Sycamore Tree, and so I read about Sycamore Tree, Prison Fellowship, thought they were doing a good job. Going into prison, I know they're doing a good job, but I know that um, when they've done their restorative justice course for six weeks, um, when they leave prison, they need a society that receives them. And so the more people who uh, recognise how valuable restorative conversations can be, uh, the better. And so if you'd like to learn more about it, uh, only on Zoom, you just access the course and listen to what they've got to say about it. I've always found their meetings very encouraging. We're hoping that uh, the Lewis Prison Fellowship that meets here on the fourth Thursday uh, will restart their meetings too. So you can be part of that if you'd like to be. Uh, that will be in the notice sheet too. I think if I shone, shone more brightly, if we all shone more brightly, we wouldn't have to try and persuade people to come to church. They just flock towards it. Just like we've said, haven't they? Moths flock to a light. We want to shine brightly, and we shine brightly as the Holy Spirit lives in us, and the temple of the Holy Spirit is thrown through us. 
we know that a majority of people don't put their trust in Jesus. That's the statistics they've forecast to us. Um, and at East Coast is probably no different. It's not that most people are intrinsically bad or wicked. Most of them are very good. But they've been deceived. They don't recognise just how important Jesus is. That his death and resurrection is life-changing. It's revolutionary. He wants to see a revolution take place so that we change from a world where people think that survival of the fittest is the norm and the correct way of addressing to one where serving other people is the way forward. And we know that because Jesus showed that he was a leader who always gave himself to the people. He was willing to take upon them their problems. He was so willing to take on their problems that he was willing to go to the cross and die on their behalf. As we know, the scribes and the Pharisees heard the message, but their power and their authority was threatened as they wouldn't listen, and instead they tried to destroy. Satan is the deceiver. He wants to deceive you and me. He wants to deceive us in our thinking in our ideas. He wants to distract us from the purposes that, he's, that God's called us for. We know that Satan was a deceiver because when we look at the story of the um, temptation of Jesus in the wilderness, he says, I could give you the world. He couldn't. It wasn't his to give. God had created a good world and he'd just been in the business of spoiling it. Jesus didn't get into a debate with him. He just quoted God's word to him from Deuteronomy and rebuked the devil. And so we need to be similarly on our guard to the attacks of the devil, the attacks of darkness. World leaders certainly may be powerful. They are powerful. They've got powerful armies that they send out. But they won't receive the worship they receive in the end because that isn't what God's plan is for them. They're called to serve. As I said, God created a world that's created not to live by survival of the fittest, but by radical, self-sacrificial serving of one another. And that's what he calls us to as well. And that's the challenge, isn't it? Radical, self-serving of other people. But we know that Jesus went before us uh, and has made it possible by the power of the Spirit the world it values the word the world in general values wealth success prosperity popularity security and so often we find ourselves tempted to be drawn by it as well we allow ourselves to adopt the when in rome do as the romans do forgetting that the roman empire um, finished because of their immorality corruption and de decadence um, but we can be deceived so easily. So easily, Jesus turns those values upside down and came to an unexpected baby, to an unmarried mother in a lowly birthplace and followed by being a refugee with a price on his head. As he grew up, he preached the good news of the kingdom of God as being available to anyone who recognised him as the Messiah. Death couldn't hold him, Jesus rose again, more full of life than anyone else. Jesus promises this everlasting life to anyone who humbles themselves and claims Jesus as their saviour. If there is anyone listening to this message who hasn't yet asked Jesus to be the saviour of their life, don't go home without talking to the friend who brought you or another Christian friend. Come and be prayed with to take those simple steps to wreck A, B and C to accept that you're, admit you're a sinner, believe that Jesus died to save you, and confirm that you want to have him as the Lord of your life. It's as simple as ABC, but it's so vitally changing. Your life changes because you've got a different centre to your life. You've got Jesus at the centre. And we can then have the God of faith filling you uh, with hope. Um, there are various lies that the devil may have 
lies for each one of us will recognise the lies that we hear day by day. But our text reminds us that we are the temple of the Holy Spirit. We are not our own, we've been brought with a price. The covenant reminds us that I am no longer my own, but yours. So our body becomes the temple of the Holy Spirit. We're units of the Holy Spirit living in a country which is not our own, insofar as our own country is heaven. We're on our way to heaven who put their trust in Jesus. But we live in this country in the meantime and need to guard against those forces that would be at work with us. We, like Jesus, will be tempted, but with God's Spirit in us, we're able to resist those temptations. But we need to be willing to confess our vulnerability and weakness. And sometimes that means even to one another. Your body may be tempted to abuse itself by working too hard. And I'd always encourage people to remember the fact that God first, family second, um, work third, service last. Don't let work or service um, cause you to lose family and God. Your chief focus is God himself. People may abuse their body by eating too much or choosing the wrong sort of food. You might abuse your body by setting standards that uh, cause you harm, choosing the wrong standards. You might abuse your mind by allowing yourself to dwell too long on things that God are not godly. You may abuse your body by conforming to the world's idea that you have a right to experience what you want and putting yourself at the centre and not respecting all those around you. Jesus is so good, isn't he, that whenever you met him, he met people, they felt respected, valued, loved, appreciated. It always amazes me how, how eager he was to help the Pharisees recognise that he was fulfilling scripture. All that they'd learnt, he was fulfilling. But they couldn't listen. Their power was threatened so much. Our body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. We're not our own, we've been bought at a price. And as I finish this message, um, I recognise there are things that we'll need to ask forgiveness for. And so we've got a couple of songs that help to reflect on the service and ask God's forgiveness. Thank you.